Yes, I think you can start. Hello. Hi, Malin, please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you, whichever time zones you're in. Um, I'd like to wa warmly welcome all of you to the Hangout, as well as the launch of our Arrow for Change Bulletin issue on sexuality, sexual and reproductive health and rights, and the internet. This bulletin issue, which explores the relationships and interdependencies influencing the premises of being online, voice, visibility, and power is a collaboration between ARO, uh, the Asian Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women, which is a regional nonprofit organization that promotes young people's and women's rights, particularly on the areas of health and sexuality, and reaffirms their agency to claim these rights, as well as a tactical Technology Collective, an international organization dedicated to the use of information for activism. At the end of this webinar, we will be giving you the download link for the publication. I am Malin Ando, by the way. I manage, I'm the managing editor for Arrow for Change. And I'd like to introduce you to Maya, who is my co-moderator for this session. Maya Indira Ganesh is the director of applied research at Tactical Tech. Her recent work includes co-writing, visualizing information for advocacy, and leading the Info Activism Camp 2013. And she's leading tactical text applied research work now in collaboration with other um, uh, organizations. If you would like to ask questions, you could ask us on Twitter at arrow underscore women, as well as um, in the chat box enabled below. I turn you all over now to Maya. Thanks a lot, Malin. And um, thanks to our panelists and to everybody who's watching and part of this today. Um, it's really very uh, wonderful to be part of this. Um, the conversation with Arrow started over a year ago about producing this particular issue of the Arrow for Change Bulletin. Uh, full disclaimer, I'm on the Program Advisory Committee of Arrow, and that's how we started talking about this. Um, I think there was a lot of mutual interest in looking at the connections between sexuality, sexual reproductive health and rights, and the Internet. Um, it's an area where I think there's been very little work and not too many perspectives, um, particularly from uh, the Asia-Pacific region. So I think both organizations were really interested in putting together something. From tactical text perspective, I'll say that um, this comes within our work on gender and technology, and uh, one part of this project is really about uh, finding ways in which we can work with different movements, and in this case with women's rights, LGBT rights activists, and on issues of sexual reproductive health and rights. Um, so we're really happy to be able to present this to all of you. Um, it's, it's been a real labor of love, and I'm very happy and grateful to the 16 contributors and writers. Um, and you're going to see their work very soon when Marlon gives you the link, uh, and especially to the Arrow team that's been able to put this together. 
So we don't have a whole lot of time, so I'm going to sort of like just skip over right to um, the, the sort of meat and potatoes of, the, of this webinar. And um, the panelists will introduce themselves a little bit later. Um, they'll have time to do that. We have Ira from New York very early in the morning and um, over there. And we have Dahlia um, also from Tactical Tech um, who's right here with me. Um, and I think, unfortunately, Melissa cannot join us, and neither can Nadine. Uh, but we'll see if they if they do come in. Um, so moving on to the the journal, the bulletin itself. I think, as I said, we were sort of curious about what is the promise of the internet for activists, um, and particularly when um, you think of working on issues around gender, sexuality, sexual reproductive health, and rights. Um, I spent the first six years of my working life working with feminist organizations in Delhi um, and I remember thinking at that time, this was in the mid-90s, that imagine if there was a way to just reach out to everybody in all of their languages and give them information about the law on violence against women or about sexuality rights, um, uh, about access to health. Um, wouldn't it be amazing if we actually had that? Uh, and then the internet came along and it seemed like, you know, it was, this was sort of tailor-made for activism, but actually it's not, and the internet was never meant for anything like that at all. Um, so the issues uh, that we face today are actually one of um, uh, sort of revealing to us what the internet is really about and where it comes from, and we're having to deal with that legacy um, in, in our use of it as activists. So the three sort of issues that the, the bulletin itself looks at, but were interesting for us to think about were this promise of freedom of speech and expression, that especially when you come from contexts where there are so many taboos, uh, there are very real limitations on communities um, speaking but also expressing themselves and having like voice and identity. Um, so freedom of speech and expression and the sort of limitations or tensions in exercising that um, was an area of interest. Um, we also wanted to look at increasing private control of the internet. Um, if one ever thought that you know your space online was your space, um, then maybe you're in for a rude shock. Um, and we wanted to look at you know what are some of the dynamics in regulation of the internet, and what do we need to be aware of as activists when we get online? How do we kind of look behind the screen at uh, what's actually happening there? We tend not to ask questions, but I think as Activists were also used to uh, you know, a political analysis of the tools, technologies, and environments that we're working in, and the internet is no is no different. Um, and finally, I think the the third issue was sort of around this sort of new internet that we're dealing with of big data and quantification, which kind of underlies um, the entire structure and architecture of the internet now anyway. But that's become part of the business model that of the internet, which is unavoidable. Um, and what does that mean for us as politically engaged actors working on a range of issues from around the world? How do we actually uh, ask questions back of big data even as it imposes a way of being online uh, for us? Um, so um, the, the sort of topics, the, the articles in the AFC you'll see are on these issues, but we also wanted to introduce um, people being able to talk about um, very personal experiences as well of what the internet uh, means for individuals but as well as for, for activists. So one of the very compelling and interesting aspects of the internet is being able to sort of escape the body and at the same time not escape the body. And by the body I refer to sort of this, this physical, you know, sort of uh, temporal space that we inhabit. Um, the ability to kind of um, uh, create or fashion different identities or speak in different voices and what the limitations of that are. I woke up this morning thinking about Kandil Baloch who was murdered recently um, and she's somebody who was pushing the boundaries in Pakistan and expressing herself and using the sort of tools that were out there um, for her and you know whatever your opinion is of her she was still exercising her rights and her freedoms and um, the, you, you can't kind of you know ignore the fact that the, the online and the offline are very intric intricately connected. Uh, we can't get very far away from that. Um, 
I think of uh, even you know sort of more bizarre or twisted stories. Many years ago, there was the case of the of Amina, the gay girl from Damascus, who wasn't even a real person, but was a persona developed by you know an American man living in Scotland who felt that he wanted to do something for LGBT people in Syria. So he you know made up this fictitious blog. Um, and uh, wrote stories about her, including you know the the, the capture and the, the disappearance of Amina, and so the internet is this place where all of these fantastical things are possible, but also the bizarre and and the strange, and all of these things are part of our activism today, and it's things that we have to start thinking about um, and asking questions of, and not just kind of receiving it. Uh, and saying, well, you know, this is it, we don't understand it. I think as activists who are not native to the internet sometimes or who are new to it, we also feel inconfident or feel like we can't ask questions. But I think part of this AFC is about trying to encourage questioning, but also trying to put a frame on how to ask those questions, particularly from a feminist perspective, and saying these are the questions we want to ask about applications of technology in sexual reproductive health and rights. And um, so I'm actually going to stop there. I don't want to say too much more because I think the panelists will have stuff to say and I would we would much rather actually hear from people who are online right now and who are part of this webinar. So what we want is for you to send in your questions. Uh, Sachini, do we have any questions already? I haven't received anything yet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you can use the Q&A app that is available on Google Hangout, or you can tweet at us using at arrow underscore women. OK. So um, should we just then, if we don't have any questions right now, maybe we can actually just go to Ira and Dalia, who can introduce themselves and talk about you know what they've written about and if we have questions coming in then we can still address them so um, I guess people sh people will use the Q&A app and I'm assuming that everyone can see the Q&A app if there are people on mobile they may not be able to access it so is there some other way in which I guess people will tweet at arrow underscore women with their questions as well so. Yeah, yeah, and we are monitoring that. Yeah, thanks. OK, great. And we also have a message that Nadine should be joining us shortly. So we will have, uh, we will have one more person coming in. OK, so maybe I can hand over now to Ira. Would you like to go first? And um, thank you for joining us really early in the morning uh, where you are. But please just give us a little introduction to yourself and Tell us about um, your experience with the AFC and what you wrote. Thanks. Hey, Maya. Thanks for that. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's afternoon there, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so my name is Ira. I am an intern at Be Change. Um, I'm currently based here in New York, but I have been an activist in Manila before I moved here for graduate school, where I studied um, basically. LGBT data in urban areas at NYU. Um, right now, I'm interning with BeChange, as I mentioned earlier. And BeChange is an organization. It's a social enterprise that primarily serves um, LGBTI youth in Southeast Asia. Um, our goal is to connect young LGBTI people to the services that they need. Thanks. Um, and I see that we have Nadine uh, with us, and then she left. Can we maybe we can move to Dahlia? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Maya. Hi, Hi everyone. Uh, um, so, so I'm actually with Maya at the office at the moment, and I just joined, uh, recently joined Tactical Tech, um, working on their gender and uh, tech project. Uh, I moved to Berlin recently from Palestine, where I've been working on a number of issues around um, the internet and society, digital activism, um, and just started doing some work on um, looking at freedom of expression 
in terms of uh, freedom of expression for women rights activists and rights defenders uh, and looking at online harassment and how that affects uh, freedom of expression online. I think Nadine just joined us, so I'll hand it over. Yeah. To yourself and what you do. Hey everyone. Can you hear me? Sorry, I'm late. Um, we can hear I you. I have some technical difficulties. Us. Excellent. So my name is Nadine Mawad. I'm from Beirut in Lebanon. Um, it's good to see everyone here. I'm excited to talk about the issue. I actually heard your introduction, Maya, from my um, from my other account where I was watching. So looking forward to unpack some of these questions. I work with the Association for Progressive Communications on their sexuality and the internet. Um, project um, and yeah. Um, so that's a little introduction. I'm going to do another check again and see if we have any questions that have come in from people. If not, I'm going to ask um, each of the panelists to actually um, talk about the area around what they wrote about for the AFC and describe their article a little bit. So can we just do a check if we have any questions or comments? Question from the or audience? Comments from the audience? Um, not yet, no. Not yet? OK. Not yet? Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, it may be possible that we're just talking to each other and there's like nobody who's on this really? webinar. No, no, there are people watching. There are people watching. <laughs> there are people watching. <laughs> but let's, let's give them something to ask about, I guess. Sure, OK. Um, sure, okay. okay. So um, who'd like to go first? Dalia, Ira, Nadine. Um, maybe we can start with Nadine. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the, the article um, that I wrote in collaboration with my colleagues at APC. I think uh, we were trying. Because in your introduction, Maya, I, I, I think you said something very significant, which is that we all feel a little bit cheated by how the internet has become today. We feel that we were promised a space where gender could be fluid, where you didn't have to perform the same expectations of masculinity and femininity, you know, where you could be cyborgs and sort of in-betweens, where you could where your gender wasn't really your first thing assigned to you when you entered the internet. And now as we see corporations take over our discussion spaces, our activist spaces, we see that activists cannot imagine organizing without Facebook or Twitter. We see that we have a lot less um, control over our discussion spaces themselves. So in the article we try to ask the question, what do we do about these toxic sorts of masculinities that are emerging online that try to silence women, that you know, you get 100 hate messages for publishing something basic and simple about violence against women or about you know, the sexual rights of women. <coughs> and the question was, sh should we invest our time in trying to change the policies of private sector uh, social networks since they're controlling these spaces where we operate? Or is there something that we should be addressing that's more trying to, to, to reclaim our own control over our activist spaces online? And how, what do we do in order to change the culture of the internet now, in order to make it safer for us to speak out, in order to sort of resist the backlash that comes with you know, speaking up and speaking out and writing our stories and telling our narratives, etc. Um, and that's, I think that's a real debate that goes back to a lot of reformist debate and people who try to work within capitalism. And that's always the main question. Yes, do we try to destroy capitalism or do we just need to fix it so that it's a little more welcoming for women? And what ends up happening is it becomes welcoming for certain women and most women get left out of the picture. Um, and yeah, so the article addresses these questions. Me, of course, I am on the side of dismantling capitalism, especially uh, you know in this technology, uh, trying to resist using the corporates to as the major space like location of our activism. 
And to think also about the neoliberal agenda of these corporations and when they do things like the Facebook rainbow filter, which I still find fascinating. I think someone should write books just about the fact that Facebook decided to create a filter for a Supreme Court decision in the United States and the globe had to respond to it. You know, I had things like relatives, friends here who have no no real, you know, opinions about LGBT issues suddenly taking this on, putting on the rainbows, or when Google puts up the Sochi Olympics rainbow doodle. I mean, these are important questions to ask about what's happening to our movements that used to be about, you know, struggles for dignity and movements where women and queers were killed to, to advance our rights. And now it's become a lot about which internet company supports LGBT rights and gives us a rainbow. And are they hijacking our movements? Are we falling prey to it? Are we being tricked? Oh, these are the questions that we ask in the article. Thanks a lot, Nadine. And I think um, you've really set us off on some very um, provocative and important issues. Uh, I just uh, read an article last night called um, We Made Feminism Mainstream and Now They're Selling It Back to Us or something like that. And it was about this idea that, you know, feminism has gone mainstream except that now you kind of have to have you know, a cupcake diet instead of a riot or, you know, there's there's a sort of feminism light that's out there. I'm not going to actually comment on that because I believe that every little bit of feminism, you know, whatever it is, I'm just happier that it's being pushed forward. Um, but I think the, the point about having to sell politics back to us through the internet, um, and this may be a good point at which to actually move to IRA because the, there is another whole reality to LGBT lives and activism and campaigning online through the internet which which uh, which Be Change works around and which you wrote about, Ira. Um, and maybe you can talk about that because it's not all rainbow filters. Right. Um, so the, the article is, um, the article I wrote for Be Change is uh, more about our experiences as an organization. And when I was talking with Maya about like what possible contributions Be Change could make to the um, to the publication, uh, we were talking about like a recent because because Be Change is relatively young in terms of the implementation of its uh, online services. So like one of our um, mobile uh, sorry one of our web apps B was just recently launched in 2015 so we were talking about like the cyber attacks that the organization experienced and how we dealt with it and Maya was like oh that's perfect because usually um, when we talk about like cyber attacks and online security we th the narratives we usually hear are individual stories like of the users and we don't hear a lot of organizations talking about their experiences dealing with these types of attacks so that's basically um, what we wrote about um, myself, Delaga, and um, through the help of our other colleagues in Be Change, so we shared a bit about our experiences, tied it up to the context of Southeast Asia and what's basically going on in social media um, with other LGBTI organizations, and shared a few things that we learned um, in dealing with these things. findings from your experiences of dealing with these attacks, your kind of, you know, learnings around security at an organizational level? Sorry, I missed the first part. The first part didn't have audio, so can, can you repeat the question? Ah, I just said, would you like to just say a little bit more about the reflections and learnings from Be Change about, you know, dealing with uh, attacks on security as an organization? Right. Um, so, basically, um, among the things, of course, the, the usual things about like having your te technical basis covered are mentioned as part of our reflections, but I think one um, important point that I'd like to highlight for now is how we realize that it's a process or, or it's important for all the members of the organization to own um, this as an issue, because usually we just like refer to our tech people to take care of the, the security issues in an organization. But in fact, like every um, every member of the organization that has access to like the social media platforms, whether or not IT is your expertise, has is 
is um, responsible for making sure that the online space for your organization and for its users is um, safe. Making about security kind of being this collective team sport um, is really relevant to a lot of groups in our region where we've been having a lot of conversations as Tactical Tech with other feminist and women's rights organizations in Asia about you know, doing kind of um, an Asian gender and tech institute. Um, we, we, we've done two so far. And one of the things we've been hearing about is organizations having to deal with everything from terrorism to, you know, religious fundamentalism to um, just kind of limitations on civil society and the sort of shrinking space for civil society. And these kinds of things are, uh, you know, they are kind of violations of, um, of our security and there's, I think there is a need to be prepared for it because though the attack may not be online, the, the internet is also used as a medium um, to kind of attack our spaces and so there's I think the need to sort of also think about security kind of like from the ground up and from our own perspectives, especially considering when people may be in environments where they're working on let's say LGBT or feminist or gender issues in, in hostile environments. Um, and we also have another article in the AFC looking at pro-choice activists in Latin America and the kind of attacks that they're facing through social media. Um, so I think it's you know an extremely relevant issue right now. Um, and then turning focus a little bit, I'm going to bring in Dahlia to talk about her article which is um, on a slightly different theme and topic and track within the AFC, but um, over to you Dahlia. Okay, thanks, Maya. Um, so I was actually involved with two different articles. Uh, the one that Maya referred to is on the quantification of uh, women's bodies through fertility and menstruation apps, uh, the mobile health apps. Um, and I think this is really interesting to look at from the perspective of the big data society that we live in, but also uh, sort of how these big corporations are taking control of our data and sort of pushing back these notification information towards the women. Uh, I mean, just thinking that only 20, 30 years ago, women were just doing all this tracking. There was a whole community of women who would basically, there was an exchange of information of how women would have to track their, their menstruation cycles how to go through pregnancies. It was always sort of this community-based uh, process where a mother would tell her daughter or a group of friends. And that is slowly shifting as uh, more and more health apps are taking over the sort of mobile market. Uh, we're seeing those fit fitness apps uh, that track our, our footsteps and track our location and everything. And then we've got the, uh, we've got these health apps that are just directed to women uh, that focus and what uh, my colleague and I, Vanessa, uh, wrote about focused on three different apps, um, fertility apps, menstruation apps, uh, and, and pregnancy tracking apps. And what we found, we looked at a number of different applications um, and we were honestly just, uh, I don't know what the right word to use, partly horrified, partly shocked uh, at how much data they track uh, from uh, the basics of weight uh, and the cycles uh, to, to, sex, the, to sort of the sexual history and, and alcohol consumption. Uh, and I think that to us was really something key that we wanted to highlight is uh, in a lot of situations uh, women give up that information willingly to get this service in return and we're not entirely sure where that data ends up, where it's stored and what's being done with it. In, in one case there's an application that actually uh, they say it on the site but they uh, give all that information that women, women willingly give up to research laboratories uh, and we're not entirely sure where, how, what is done with that information. On the other hand we also have you know these applications push out notifications so um, for, for women who uh, for example track uh, their fertility, there are different things, measurements that they, they give up and in return they get the sort of best fertile days that they can get uh, become pregnant. And it's interesting to see how 
there's a sense of normalization that is happening to women's uh, bodies through this quantification, where women have to follow a certain things. Uh, women historically have had their own control over their information and their bodies, and now with these applications, it's becoming sort of the the general. It's becoming part of this global trend of this is what a woman's body should should be like, or this is how fertility should be tracked. And so I think to us looking at both how the data is stored, how much data is stored, and how these algorithms that process that information and what is pushed back to women is really interesting. This was sort of scratching the surface and, you know, our article really puts out more questions than it tries to answer, and I think it's really an interesting thing to start looking at um, when it comes to the quantification and, and the big data society. Okay, thanks, thanks Dalia. Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, uh, Malin, are you um, going to take some uh, I got, comments or questions? I got a question from Jeffrey Akaba of Youth Lead. So I'll just read its part comment, part question. So for him, he sees the internet like a film a platform that imitates life, and when the internet was born, it does not have rules. My question is, how do we make sure that we are able to establish and protect our spaces, or activist spaces like was mentioned in the World Wide Web, especially at this time when you have other virtual communities building their own social worlds in cyberspace too? So I guess anyone, including Maya, could respond to it? Um, I. Uh, I'd, I'd ask that you know if anybody on the panel first would like to respond to to that first activists securing their spaces. I guess I can take a shot. But I think the Thanks. second half of the question was what, what do you do now when other social groups are also on the internet like fundamentalists and. Uh, Okay, yes, I think the first thing to be aware of is that the internet is sort of the space under our feet is changing constantly, you know? Like, there are decisions being made about um, whose voices are privileged online, there's decisions, algorithms that are programmed to give voice to certain group and not to others. Um, so, with also with this talk about hate speech, say hate speech and dangerous and uh, uh, what are they calling it now? Sort of not letting groups recruit or radicalize young people, etc. Um, I think as the space shifts underneath us that we're occupying, there are some basic feminist frameworks uh, which we shouldn't let go of, right? One is that we know the best for us to organize is to have self-organizing, community-led organizing, being able to decide where and when we meet and under which conditions, being able to set the terms for the discussion. Um, two is, it's true, as more people are coming online, and I think my prediction is that the next three billion will be connected within the next year or two years, whereas the first three billion took us 30 years to connect, we're going to have like this spike in internet, like everybody's coming online, which is a good thing, right, because we want access, but also we should be aware that this change of the landscape, the landscape in which we're speaking. And I remember Maya, when I first met you on Twitter, it was like you and me and a bunch of us, no? It was like, it was quite a small community, we felt that if we said something there, it really didn't matter, nobody was listening. Um, and we always criticize each other for occupying space, and nobody's there. But now, it's and now you never talk to me, Nadine, on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've down I've downsized my use of these social networks quite quite radically, because it just seems that suddenly every tweet you make is an important public statement. Which, you know, they, the the saying now is. Uh, uh, dance like nobody's watching tweet, like your tweet is going to be read in a legal court case someday. Like there's that much change in the sphere in which we are 
as much as I think about sitting on less of a technical question and more of a social question, right? So how do we the support networks to to sort of enable us to say what we want to say and to build a platform? One of the examples I think is that uh, people think that in terms of creating safe spaces? I think we lost Hello? Nadine. Um, can I jump in? Yes, yes. 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 Sure. Sorry. 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 sorry, we lost Nadine, but she, she said something that uh, I think is very crucial. Um, basically, she's, I think the last sentence she said was about networks of support, and, um, and that's something that we definitely highlight in our work in the Gender and Tech Institutes here at Tactical Tech. Um, it's working with women activists and women champions within their communities and helping build up their skills uh, so that they can raise awareness within their communities, help in terms of both social and technical uh, sort of empowerment to their communities. So our, the Gender and Tech Institute, we bring in uh, women uh, activists for a week-long training on issues around um, privacy, uh, big data, um, and, and sort of gender and technology and, and digital security, and wrapping it up in sort of within the feminist perspective. And these women go back to their communities um, and work within their communities. They start running a number of events uh, like training, hackathons, even skill shares, uh, and they start working on their own localized resources uh, and curricula that they can feed back to those communities. So I'm, I'm really glad, Nadine, that you mentioned the networks of support because this is something that I think would definitely help in reclaiming uh, safe spaces on the internet and uh, not necessarily from a technical perspective, although using technical skills in a sense uh, and, and reclaiming these safe spaces. Uh, and I see Nadine is, is back. <laughs> Anything else to add, Nadine, or does Ira want to respond as well? I mean, yeah, I agree. Maybe I'll let um, Nadine finish off uh, what she was talking about first, and then I'll jump in. Okay, thanks. Sorry, my my connection dropped. <laughs> um, yeah. So what what I wanted to say is that the the just to give an analogy, I think now what's changed, and this will continue to change. So we have to keep on monitoring this. What's changed now is that when you go online with a blog post or content or a status or a tweet, for me, it's the very same thing as walking down to the street and saying what you want to say, right? So, so you expect if you went down to the streets and said, you know, women should reclaim their sexualities, you're going to get people angry and pissed off and you're throwing things at you and telling you to get off the street, etc. And it's sort of the same way. It's like, you know, this public sphere. So when we, when we think about how we organize protests in public squares, that's the same sort of methodology we should use to think about how we organize protests of, of content, of, of thought discourse building on the internet. And that's the same thing. We would never go to a protest three or four people and say, you know, what we want to say, because we know the risks associated with that. So, so it's the same sort of idea online. We need to be big in numbers, we need to be, like Dalia said, you know, good with the, the tactical skills and the technology. Uh, we need to be, you know, thinking about the backlash, we need to be strategic about how we organize. And this is all, again, I say it breaks my heart what the internet has become and it breaks my heart, but, but I'm trying to come to terms with it. You know, this is what it is now. Right. So, picking up on Nadine's point, I think both Dalia and Nadine raised very important points about the importance of understanding how the online space replicates um, the offline spaces that we actually live in. I think the, the more we understand how how the two are similar, the more we understand the landscapes better. 
um, the more we learn um, how to protect ourselves. Protect ourselves. So basically, on a personal level, the basic ones. I, I feel like you should always be uh, very aware of the information you share. And there are actually organizations because when we think about um, digital security and digital um, safety, we usually think about very high-end like types of like very technical trainings. When in fact, some organizations run trainings that are actually very basic, just about understanding how the online spaces work, how the internet works. Because like some people, like a, a lot of the members of our communities, they go on the internet and then when they fill out forms, they don't realize the implications of the information they give. Like even like the, the these these are things that for us who grew up in this generation that is very much aware of like the implications of like what the dig digital space is where it's it's easy for us to overlook the importance of these uh, training people about the implications of these basic elements of the internet so just being very aware of what personal information you share is actually a big thing and understanding where it goes I think we have a new question, Malin. Something come up? None has reached me mm -hmm. so far. Yeah, the, um, there was a question, but I think an anonymous question, with, uh, maybe I'll just read it out because I can see it. Um, with all the hate speech and tracking, how does one regulate the internet? This is bearing in mind that technology moves faster than we can understand it, and at the same time maintaining the freedom on the internet. Should we or should we not regulate it? Super question. Regulate the internet. Hmm. And maybe attached to that, um, you know, we're talking about accountability of social media corporations as well and internet governance. Maybe I could. Maybe I could tackle it. Uh, so. It's interesting. I mean, we are seeing regulations on the internet, and it's not just coming from from the private companies. We're also seeing uh, government organizations and the infrastructure is regulating the internet as well. And I would direct people to read the fact file in the uh, in AFC to look at more uh, more about the regulations that is happening in in Asia Pacific countries. But I think. Um, in terms of hate speech, when it comes to hate speech, in recent years we're seeing a lot more visibility of, of cases of hate speech, even though this has been an issue that has been there since the beginning of the internet. Um, and what we're seeing, in, in, particularly in the, in the last, I want to say, three, four years, a lot of those so social media corporations coming up and adding certain uh, blocking uh, mechanisms and filters and reporting mechanisms for people to report on hate speech or misogyny or, or harassment. And I think while this attempts to solve the issue, we do hit, a, uh, we do hit the whole question of, well, if there is this blocking mechanism, is that also a form of censorship? Like, where is people's freedom of expression when it comes to that? And how do we control, like, when it comes to certain blocking features that uh, follow, let's say, a, bla uh, a blacklist uh, uh, words, uh, basically, if, if it's going to block certain words, who gets to uh, basically set this list? Uh, who gets to uh, control the algorithms or read the algorithms that do this filtering process? And so we hit a wall where it's like, where, where it's a thin line between freedom of expression freedom of expression, regulation, and censorship. And I think in some way, um, there, I, I think we're still in this position where uh, it's unclear whether regulating is really solving this issue through these blocking and filtering mechanisms. But on the other hand, we're seeing also other uh, things come up, other initiatives that are coming up that it's sort of like networks of support that support women who are being harassed, uh, offer, uh, offer some information, offer some support in terms of emotional or technical support. And then we're seeing issues around counter speech as well, which can fight back all of the hate speech. So I think there is a movement where it's like there is this push towards regulation, which also falls like basically hits the risk of censorship. And then on the other hand, we're looking at 
issues around counter speech and networks of support. And I think we're at this, we're at a fine line seeing which one, I don't know whether it's a battle or not, but they are moving along each, uh, alongside each other. Anyone else yes. want to add something before we move to the next question? Yes, I want to jump in a bit uh, to follow up on Dania about this um, question of regulation. I think it's very incorrect to look at one answer as if the internet is one space. No. So if I had an online forum of sorts where I had you know you five people on it and it was a space to discuss things, I have the right to regulate and say you know I don't want sexist remarks in this forum. Um, I gave this talk on privacy and gender just the other week, and a man literally stood up in the session and said, I'm going to say something that's going to offend women. I was like, no, you can't say it. It's my session. And they were very angry and said I was oppressing his freedom of speech. But I was saying, actually, you know, I control the session. But it was actually the organizer who controlled the session, and he forced me to take the question from the man, which turned out to be the silliest question. But just to say that we have a right to regulate, and the question is, who owns, who has this right? So the first thing people think about is the state. No, the state has a board, and this board will regulate everything. And so we become unable to actually do the regulation that th we think is healthy or we want to do. Or something like a private company like Facebook has the right to say, we don't want nipples on Facebook. But Facebook has such a responsibility now, and the accountability that we were talking about in terms of the policies that they set sort of influence culture and norms in a global way, in a very powerful way. So we want to be able to say, to influence these spaces that we are part of, no? as users of these spaces. But to be honest, I don't think that's going to go anywhere. I think Facebook is very adamant about their real name policy and other such you know, regulation of content. We're not going to reach anywhere with them. But we have, to think, we have to break down regulation and not look at it as only evil or only good but also look at the space that we're in because again similar to public spaces to physical spaces I know that the street is regulated by certain rules whether I agree to them or not I can always resist I can always change I can always you know break these rules but I also know that my family living room has certain norms and rules and is regulated you know by a certain culture and there's things that I say there and there's things that I don't and my own house or my own community of activists, we also have our sort of regulation of what is said, what's not acceptable. Of course, we're not for criminalizing it, we're for talking about it, but just to break down regulation and not look at it as an either or sort of thing. Thanks a lot, Nadine. And I think because of time, we're going to have to move to the next question. But you know, this is a topic that I think we only need to talk more and more about within activist networks, especially. Um, so there's a question from Malaysia. Um, hi, how is the internet used to approach youths in Malaysia, especially on sexual reproductive health and rights, as they cannot do, through, do so through schools, and how effective has it been? I'm wondering if um, there's anybody from Arrow, I mean, whether it's Sachini or Malin, if either of you would actually like to respond to that first. To give the link? Arrow actually has developed uh, an app for on sexuality education in Malaysia, and um, it's available in Android for now. Uh, but we actually haven't had a chance to evaluate it so far in terms of its effectivity. There has been quite a number of downloads, though. Um, Sachini, would you have the the app link? I can I can share it um, later. Right. Yeah. All right. We can publish that on Twitter. Also. But maybe okay. Dalia, you could also just uh, because your article in the AFC actually tackled the issue of uh, sexuality education online as well. Maybe you could add to that. Yeah, um, definitely. So the fact file uh, was looking at 10 different countries um, in Asia Pacific uh, region and one of them was Malaysia and um, I was actually just uh, thinking back of what I uh, wrote about Malaysia and I think it's really interesting because we, the fact file itself addressed this issue from three different perspectives. One is uh, looking at access and infrastructure, the other is looking at freedom of expression in terms of censorship. Um, 
and regulations around, for example, laws banning pornography, and then looking at uh, regulations, and the third part is looking at regulations around, for example, sexual education or laws around sexuality and all these issues. And I think with Malaysia, it's, it's kind of tricky because you, compared to a lot of countries in the region, there is a high percentage of connectivity within the population and amongst youth, but uh, looking at sort of the regulations uh, on the ground, looking at the fact that they, for example, ban uh, pornography, uh, that uh, bloggers don't necessarily have uh, have complete freedoms to like to basically post things because they're held responsible for the content that they post, uh, and looking at issues around, uh, for example, their data privacy laws, we see that there's a it's it's a tricky situation because when people are held responsible for what content they post, they can, uh, and there's a, a law that bans pornography, that could put people at risk even if they post anything about sexual content. So there's this very murky place where um, people have some freedoms, have access to the internet, uh, but don't necessarily have complete freedoms where they can uh, post uh, information about sexuality, about sexual health, because they are held responsible for these issues. And with the murkiness in terms of data privacy laws, uh, governments can track people uh, and what access, what information they access online. So I think it's, uh, again, it's like a, uh, it's a tricky situation when it comes to Malaysia, because people have to balance it, balance the content that they post quite right. Okay, I, I think we're kind of running out of time, yes? And we don't have any other questions. Um, if it's okay with everyone else, just as we kind of wrap up, um, I thought, I mean, this we hadn't actually discussed this as part of our agenda, but I just wanted to share more about the, the journal itself and the topics that I ended, and maybe Malin, you could talk a little bit about just the process of developing this and, and how it was put together. Um, do we have time for one question? Something came oh, there is up. A question that's Sorry, gone. yeah. Um, so this is from Modi Shah. Uh, some conservative societies associate sexual and reproductive health and rights with fornication and sex. How can we draw a line? What is the effective way to deal with it on the internet? Yeah, anyone want uh, Yeah, I kind of want to say that, um, yeah, actually, you know, fornication and sex are very real things that happen. And, you know, it happens online, offline. It's part of SRHR. It's part of a whole lot of things. What can you do? <laughs> it's there. I don't know if um, I, I think, think we're kind of focused on human rights here, including the human right to sex and fornication. Um, and I don't think we're in the business of sort of drawing these lines. Um, so, but you know, referring back to what Nadine said before about you know within within one spaces, unfortunately, people do have the right to do that. So sometimes when it comes to family, whoever is in control of that family gets to decide you know, what is allowed and not allowed to be spoken about. Um, but as far as, um, I mean, there's always sort of counter speech and counter power and counter moves and narratives. And I think perhaps that's, uh, there are still these sort of glimmers um, of, of, well, I don't want to say hope. I'm too much of a skeptic now. But um, I think somewhere we're all still tech utopians. We still believe it's possible somewhere, you know, under the layers of kind of cynicism and stories of um, violence and abuse and harassment. Um, so, yeah, I think I'd like to perhaps, you know, just deal with that question like that and not open it up further. Um, and Malin, some, I think we should just go straight to you and... But we cannot hear you. Hello? Hello? Hi. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. All right, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I thought it had disappeared again. No, I just wanted to also just say that it is true that sex is one of the main reasons that uh, governments actually cite for censorship. But, uh, and 
I agree with Maya. Definitely sex and sexual rights is a whole part and parcel of sexual and reproductive health and rights. But we must also make a distinction in terms of saying what, who gets to say what is harmful sexual content, really. Because a lot of content that's out there is actually, that's about sex, is actually very helpful. Uh, content about sexual health, content about sexuality, about LGBT IQ sexuality, about information on contraception, on safe uh, uh, abortion, on medical abortion. All of this are very critical information that needs to be available to people. And it's part of our sexual and reproductive health and rights, actually. So, um, and I'm sorry, and I, just to interject, I would add and say that in addition to information, people are also uh, sexual beings. There's also pleasure to be had in yeah, those things yeah. that we may think of as are, you know, maybe questionable to some, but we're not just kind of, you know, people who need to be educated about how to be safe. Um, I think there's there's a lot of potential out there, and unfortunately, you know, one kind of flows through the same pipes um, as the other kind of information. So, yeah, sorry, just to add that and back to you, Malin. Yeah, so maybe just to share also the other articles that are available in the bulletin, uh, talking about sex and pleasure and the right to pleasure. One of the articles is uh, by a disability rights activist who actually talks about sexuality and disability and the internet. Um, and unfortunately, she couldn't, Yidi Goyal couldn't join us, but that's one of the very interesting articles that we featured. We also looked at, uh, an article also looked at the different ap applications and the use of technology for sexual and reproductive health and rights by Rebecca Gompertz of Women on Web. And we also had an article that look at big data and it's unfortunate that Melissa who wanted to join couldn't in the end join and um, I don't know whether Maya would want to talk about that as she closes uh, more in terms of big data and the risks of that especially as we looked at it in terms of connecting it with the sustainable development goals and use of data and indicators and what are the potential risks of that as well as opportunities. Um, yeah, so we will actually be posting live the internet after this chat, and it's right now available at sorry at http um, uh, at bitl.ly slash afc internet. So, and I think it's going to be flashed on the screen as well. Will it be? So otherwise, we will actually put it up on Twitter. So we we okay. really hope that you can download it, and we'd like you to enjoy reading. Um, Malin, we have another question. Sorry. Oh, okay. yeah. Sorry. One more question. Oh. Which I said that well. Which I said that well. <laughs> All right. Sorry, so can Malin. Someone read it. You're sorry, How do I we can't convince see the, the questions. Yeah, I, I can read it, no problem. How do we convince women's rights organizations working on discrimination that online violence against women uh, should be part of their work? Example, Nepal Domestic Violence Bill does not include online violence. Um, I'm going to take this one and um, maybe start it off, and if other panelists have something to say, aware of the fact that we don't have so much time left, so I'll also try not to talk too much. Um, I'm kind of split about this. I think that yes, we do need to broaden definitions of violence. We do need to look at the ways in which domestic violence today is enacted through um, uh, things like mobile phones. Um, I mean, this has been there from the beginning, control of women's spaces, whether it's a mobile phone or something else. Um, that's always been there. I mean, domestic violence is, is essentially about that kind of power and control. Um, so I feel like even our idea of domestic violence needs to expand. Um, at the same time, I wonder about NGOs and activist groups that have a certain history, have a certain capacity, serve a certain community. What does it mean to start taking on tech issues and 
making that your issue. I think there's a way in which you need to be able to understand um, what the intersections are for your work, but ramping up to become a tech organization that actually addresses violence against women online and offline, I think there's a learning curve to that. And I think it's, um, I think there's a lot of things to consider within what you can actually take on. More interesting, as I've said, is this kind of dynamic between how things can act, get enacted online and, and offline. Um, so I'm going to stop there. And I don't know if any other panelists want to add anything to that. Yeah, if, if I may add, because I think this is an increasing issue uh, that is uh, basically domestic violence using mobile phones and also um, issues like, for example, or tactics like revenge porn, uh, where former partners uh, also take uh, private information, images, videos, and then post them online. And I think what organizations can help support women with is is more the emotional support more so than technical support or legal support. So I think there are a lot of initiatives that are emerging more so maybe in the US and Western world uh, around issues like legal support when there aren't any laws around revenge porn, how do women go about and remove that content uh, uh, from from the internet. And so I think there are uh, there are ways to support women that aren't necessarily technical, and I think part of it would be advocacy, policy, and uh, and legal support. Yeah, I agree. I, th I think there are like um, w existing ways in which organizations try to address this issue, but like in w with the question of how we could possibly convince organizations to take on this type of work to those who are resistant to it. Maybe I think this is where we have some gap in terms of information. So I guess more research on what does um, what it looks like, what what violence against women online actually looks like, and how pe what people are doing now. Like research on that would help probably take us further on this issue. Thank you. Um, I think finally you can close this for us, Pauline. <laughs> that we would really look forward to having and this I think this a arrow for change bulletin and this uh, Google Hangout is one uh, one way to do this and it's just a start but really building linkages and alliances between the tech for change movements as well as the SRHR and sexuality movements would really really be critical I think uh, a lot of us operate uh, still in silos uh, to a large extent, so uh, hopefully this will be the start and we will continue our conversations. So thanks everyone for listening and watching and for asking questions, so thank you and we'll sign off. Bye. Thanks very much to Arrow in particular for putting this together, thanks a lot and to the Bye. panelists, thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you very much. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks Achini. Bye.